It is indeed a privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. Daniel Duda, a colleague and a friend. We have spent time together at the Trans-European offices and I have appreciated his friendship over the years. Actually, Dr. Duda is no stranger to most of you, those here in the audience, maybe you're in the overflow room, or if you're looking on uh, the web or uh, the satellite, I'm sure many of you know him and have appreciated his messages. Currently, Dr. Duda is working for the Trans-European Division as an Education Director and the Associate uh, Director of Ministerial uh, Department. Previously to that, he has served in uh, both European, uh, of the other European divisions, that is the Euro-Asia Division, where he was based in Moscow, and he was at our seminary um, up there, as well as uh, in the Euro, or the former Euro-Africa region, which is now the Inter-European Division. And uh, Dr. Duda loves studying the Bible. And not only studying it, but then sharing what he gets from the Bible. I have been blessed from his, the messages I, I have heard from him, and I'm sure you will be as well today. So Dr. Duda, thank you for coming up and uh, taking this service. And we look forward to getting, receiving a special message from you that God has given you. So good morning, everybody. By now, every speaker has said how happy they are to be in Prague. So you don't need to hear it from me. You know it's true anyway. <laughs> I had the privilege of living in this city for six years when I was at the Union and taught in the nearby seminary. But that was almost 15 years ago. I can hardly believe that. Now I very seldom get a chance to preach in Prague. And to preach in Prague and in English, wow! <laughs> the last time I preached in Prague in English was in 1992 for a Bible conference organized by Euro-Africa Division. Let's get to the message. One day, a woman finds out that she's going to have a baby. And when the day comes, she gives birth to a little boy. She and her husband are thrilled. They tell their friends, they thank God. But over a period of time, they start to discern that something is just not right. The boy does not respond to visual cues. He doesn't seem to recognize them. And eventually the penny drops. The boy is blind. Now they live in a part of the world and times when there are no resources, no special classes for disabled children, no books in Braille, no help. He has no other similar children to play with. They realize he's not going to get married, he's not going to have a job or hold a job, and they worry what is going to happen to him when they die. He has to beg for living, and he does this a year after year. And though there are many people all around him, very few actually notice him. Until one day, when a group of religious people are walking past him, and he hears they are talking about him. One of them says, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In the jo uh, Gospel of John, chapter 9, you find the story. A strange question, who sinned, he or his parents? Now, if the man is born blind, how could have his sin caused it? But you know, some rabbis thought that it was possible for a baby to be born sinful if an expectant mother entered a heathen temple, then the fetus was actually judged to be guilty 
of the sin of idolatry. Thus they believed that it's possible for the fertus to sin. You see, rabbis had some interesting theology. But if you look into the Bible, you discover that it actually it was Jesus, the one who noticed the blind man. In fact, the story in John 9 starts, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. As Jesus went along, he saw. What matters a lot in life begins with what you see as you go along. And if you go along with Jesus, you start seeing what Jesus sees. Now there is an old song, nobody will know it here, but we used to sing it when I was a little boy growing up in Sabbath school, children's Sabbath school, shortly after the flood. And the song goes something like this. Be careful, little eye, what you see. Be careful, little eye, what you see. Now, I need to tell you I never liked that song. <laughs> to me, it sounded like a big brother. Be careful, you know, little eye, what you see. And I, when I learned English, at least I learned that in the English version there is, there is Father up above who is looking down in love. Now, there was no love in the Czech edition that I learned. <laughs> it was just the, the policeman version. Be careful, little eye, what you see, because Father in heaven is looking at you. And of course, if you grew up under communism, then don't be surprised that I am allergic to any kind of big brother or surveillance. <laughs> but well, Jesus sees this guy. And the disciples immediately ask, who sinned? He? His parents? That he was born blind. Before you judge the disciples too quickly and too harshly, let me tell you, you ask this question if you actually hold on to a belief in God's justice. Because if you believe that there is something in the life which is unfair, yet your God is all good, all powerful, all loving and all fair, then you somehow need to get around the problem of what you see. How do you do it? Oh, you say, it only seems unfair, but it actually isn't. There is some kind of secret sin going on which is being punished. Now that's a comfortable explanation to believe, especially if you happen to be well off, well fed, and healthy in body. Because then it implies, in other words, that you are not guilty of that secret sin. <coughs> but what is the reality? Does the fact that we are all here nicely dressed, and most of us not obviously and physically disabled, mean that there is no secret sin going on in our lives? And what is the consequence of such theology, of such belief? If you think that somebody is disabled or suffering because of their own sin, you are off the hook. You don't have to help them out. You can keep them at arm's length because somehow they deserve the situation in which they are found. So the disciples can say, let's have some theological discussion. Let's solve some philosophical riddle. Let's deal with this difficult dilemma. And then you can discuss the ideas, split the hair until cows come home. And you are not disturbed by somebody else's suffering. You can feel how clever you are 
You don't need to get your hands dirty and engaged in the pain of another human being. Isn't it strange how religion can actually make people less compassionate? For disciples, the man is an object, an object for discussion, and maybe a potentially an object for healing by Jesus. But if you look at the story, who is the first one in our story who needs the healing? The disciples, their theology. Their stony hearts. Actually, us. Our theology. Our stony hearts. Because if you use theology to feel superior over somebody else, there is something seriously wrong. And so the disciples say, Who sinned? This man or his parents? And Jesus replied, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Actually, you are asking the wrong question. You are looking at someone to blame. We often do that when we are suffering. We like to find a mechanistic cause and effect. I realize that even when my wife says, I have a headache today, my first response would be, what caused it? And she said, Daniel, it doesn't matter. I need empathy. Jesus said, look at what God can do. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Do you see what Jesus did here? To a philosophical question, a difficult philosophical question, you know what he does? He connects what's going on with the prologue of John's Gospel. Have you heard these words about the light of the world? Have you heard that before? It's so easy for us to find a philosophical solution. God is always fair. So what this guy did must not be fair. And therefore he is somehow guilty. I don't know how, but he surely is. Case closed, problem solved. Serve the Sabbath lunch, pass on the casserole. <laughs> but Jesus says, being born blind doesn't mean that he must have sinned. It doesn't mean that his parents must have sinned. Something bigger is going on. Something more mysterious and more hopeful than that. The chaos of this present world is the raw material from which the loving, wise, and just God is making a new creation. Look at instead at what God can do. When G John tells this story, he clearly connects it with the prologue where in chapter 1, in verse 4, John says, In him, that is Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's exactly what's going on. Into the darkness of this man comes the light of the world. And have you heard this language before? John connects it not only with verse 1, but you have heard this language in Genesis 1. At the start of the book of Genesis, God was faced with chaos. But Moses did not waste any time explaining to you 
describing the chaos, analyzing it, discussing whose fault it was. Instead, he tells you that God created light and following the light, the whole new world. So that's why John wants you to understand that Jesus is doing the work of the one who sent him. He's continuing the work of creation. He connects it with the preceding story of the Bible to show that Jesus came to create a new, better world. And what he does here and now is just an illustration of his power to deal with any chaos in any life. See what God can do. See what can be. Human suffering that we see around us is pushing us to look for forward towards God's new creation. The time when God will make all things new. But for those who see that, our eyes need to be healed first. You and I don't see it naturally. You and I don't see what damage our theology is doing to another human being who do not happen to be in our privileged category, who might happen to be disabled, sick, with AIDS, wrong gender, wrong church, eating wrong food. Actually, this story in John 9 taught me there is another way of looking at that children's song that I learned as a little boy. You see, be careful little stomach what you eat. And because you are being watched, what do you do? You watch somebody else's plate. Be careful, little eye, what you see? Somebody else's plate. But actually, that song says, be careful, little eyes, that you see what Jesus sees. Be careful, little feet, that you go where Jesus would go. Be careful, little hands, that you do what Jesus' hands would do. See what God can do. I can't, but he can heal my eyes. So who is the first one whose eyes are the ones that need healing? The disciples' eyes, mine eyes, yours. All right, Jesus says, I need to do the work of the one who sent me while the sun is shining because the darkness will come. And so he spits on the ground to make a little mud and puts it on the man's eyes, tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and then the man goes home seeing. Now, you would expect that this will be a moment of universal joy, and they lived happily ever after. True? No. The story goes on that his neighbors and those who have formerly seen him started to ask, isn't this the man who used to sit and bang? Others said, no, 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 that's not him. You know, when you are suffering, when you are disabled, when you are not part of the inner circle, people tend to not to see you. Think about this. This man has been begging in that spot for all his life. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how long, but that must have been at least 20 years, maybe 30, maybe 40 years. But people pay no attention to him. Although he was there day after day, decade after decade, they are not sure. They can't decide. Is it the same guy? Is it him? Is it somebody else? And he has to say, hey, it's me. It's me. So the second one, who is the second one in our story who needs healing? 
the neighbors. People create society, God creates community. When we think about healing, we think about them. Somehow somebody should help them. But God says, no, the society needs to become a community. Do you know what's going outside of the walls of your church? Are you here for the community? Or is the society out there just a missionary project? An object for you? They are not going to accept what we tell them anyway, so to hell with them. Let me tell you something. Because we started in 19th century East Coast America as a movement, we are obsessed with the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. If there is a personal devil, and if there is going to be an eschatological crisis at the end of ages, truth is very important. I don't diminish that. But it's not the most important. The most important thing is community. God exists in community as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One day, everything that you see is not going to be. The only thing that will remain is the community. The community of redeemed people. And the earthly and the heavenly family will be one. Because God exists in community. The most important thing in the universe is community. So, who needs to be healed? Who needs healing? The disciples. The community. All right. Then the community asks, so how did he... Did you get healed? How then were your eyes opened? He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to a pool of Siloam and to wash. I went, and washed, then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Notice how this guy's understanding of Jesus is going to develop through this story. Who is this man? I have no idea, I don't know. So they bring in the Pharisees to check these guys out. Verse 14. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Anybody can smell what's coming next? <laughs> on Sabbath, you are not supposed to work. That's what the commandment says. But Jesus did kneading on Sabbath. In order to make mud out of dust, he was kneading and thus breaking the rules. You see, on Sabbath, healing, oddly enough, was not allowed. The rule was that on Sabbath you could get medical treatment only if life was actually in danger. So you could help other people on Sabbath to keep them from dying, but not to improve their condition. So death prevention is okay. Improvement is not okay. So if your hand or foot get dislocated, you are actually not allowed to pour cold water on it because that's improvement. That will help heal the strain. But Jesus was kneading on Sabbath, making mud. And so the Pharisees say, this man is not from God, because he's not keeping the Sabbath. You see, they make far-reaching conclusions based on their theology, on their interpretation. Now, we know that God sees it the way we see it. Case closed. And so he is not from God because he breaks our rules. Hmm. So 
So they turned again to blind man. What do you have to say about him? Now imagine after the spiritual experts in theology say, we know this man is not from God, the man replied, actually he's a prophet. This man dares to contradict the experts. Amen. He must be a prophet. Of course, the Pharisees don't like the answer. So you know what they do? Verse 18. They sent for his parents. Do you remember when you misbehaved? Where is Gary Hopkins? When you misbehaved at ch school, they call the parents. So they call the parents and they say, Is this your son? Can you explain how come he can see? We know, verse 20, that he is our son. The DNA tests prove that. The parents answered, and we know that he was born blind, but now how he can see, who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is an adult. He can speak for himself. Now, mom and dad are not going to risk anything here to take care of their boy. Why? His parents said this because they were afraid. They are scared. They are afraid of getting in trouble. Why such an anxiety on the part of parents? Because the leaders of the society already decided that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as a Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Now let me tell you that in this context, being put out of the synagogue does not mean that you cannot come to worship with fellow Judeans. It means you are out of the social life. Synagogue was the focus of the whole community. If you are put out of the synagogue, there is no option for you than just leave the area. You remember the thinking? Byť ruský je to byť pravoslavný. No? To be Serbian means to be orthodox. No? Co Čech, to muzikant. <laughs> there is this social pressure. And they are afraid to go against the current. The pressure system, the wife is afraid of her husband. The husband is afraid what his mother will say. The children are scared what the parents say. The followers are afraid of the leaders. And so the man's parents are afraid because they know the threat of going against what somebody in power doesn't want to hear. They are anxious for their social standing, for their livelihood, perhaps for their lives. So anxious in fact, that they allow their son to be grilled. He's grown up. He can speak for himself. Ask him. He is of age. True. But hardly a statement of a loving or caring parent. So who needs healing? Remember, I'm a teacher. You're supposed to learn something. The first who needs healing in the story are? The disciples. The second that needs the healing? The community. The third that needs the healing? The parents. The family systems. And the story goes on. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Listen to this. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. Here is the Bible. Swear that you are going to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And by that time, you know what he is supposed to say, what he is expected, what is the truth. They already determined the truth. We know, notice, here is the little magisterium talking. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, I'm an uneducated beggar. You guys are experts with your PhDs in theology. 
I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. You can argue with about theology, but you can't argue about an experience. This guy, a blind, educated, uneducated beggar, is taking on trained religious experts, is one of the most amazing, undoubted characters in the Gospel of John. I know one thing. I was lost, but now I am found. I was enslaved, but now I am free. So they try it again. So tell us, how did he do it? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27, he answered, I have already told you and you did not listen. Now, that's a perceptive. Did he go to a counseling course? You know, that's very perceptive. You didn't pay attention to my answers. Maybe you want to hear it again because you want to become his disciples. <laughs> now, this guy has a little attitude going on. And you know what happened? Then they hurled insults on him and said, you are this fellow disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know, see, we know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. By the way, did they know where he comes from? If you read Gospel of John, in one of the following chapters, they are going to say, he cannot be the Messiah, because when the Messiah comes, he will be from Bethlehem, but this guy is from Nazareth, so he cannot be Messiah. So they know where he's from Nazareth, but they, oh, we don't know where he comes from, whatever is convenient. The man answered, now this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And learn, notice how quickly he picks up. We know <laughs> the magisterium has moved on. <laughs> now it's with him, not with them. Here's the teaching office. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. This is good theology. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard about opening the eyes of a man who was born blind. If this man is not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. Have you heard that theology before? How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So, who needs healing? Pharisees. Now, I don't need to comment on that because we don't have them anymore. True? <laughs> we can move on. They died out with the first century Judaism. True? Let me give you a, what William Johnston, the former editor of Adventist Review, said. You would not believe the amount of hate mail that I get. People feel they can be mean because they are right. There is something intoxicating in being right. You see, because of sin, all of us struggle with inferiority. Just some of us are better at masking it, hiding it. So some will be talkative, but others will be quiet, depending how you are wired. Some try to be funny, some try to be important. It influences the cars that we drive, the houses we live in, the positions we try to attain, the significance others ascribe to us. But the most dangerous form of dealing with your own inferiority is when you pull in God and you say, me and God think this way. Because I don't think like you do, I think like God thinks. Now that's serious blindness in a need of healing. 
This is spiritual abuse. You cannot pull the big guy on your side. Most of you know that I have two boys. When they have been small, about six and four, five and three, I suddenly hear a cry coming from the children's room. And in a little while, the younger one, Roman, comes to my office crying. <laughs> Roman, what happened? Marek took my crayons. Okay. So go and tell him how you feel about it. He disappeared. And in a little while, I heard from the next room, Marek, Dad says that you are supposed to give me back my crayons. <laughs> So I called him back and said, Roman, we have some misunderstanding going on. <laughs> some semantical misunderstanding. <laughs> he wanted to pull in the big guy on his side. <laughs> Don't we all? But you can't do that. That's spiritual abuse. So who needs healing? The us, Pharisees. This fundamentalistic mindset. Thinking that me and God see it the same way. Here's the beautiful thing. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And remember where are we? We are in John 9. Anybody knows what Jesus is going to say in John 10? I am a good shepherd. So when the shepherds kicked him out, verse 35, when Jesus heard that they have thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have seen him, and in fact, that's the one who is speaking with you right now. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And the man says, I trust you, sir. And he worshipped him. Who needs healing? Everybody's spiritual perception needs healing. The most important thing is not that his retina, that his eyes are okay, that his optical nerve is healed. The most important thing is that he can see the Son of Man, the one who delivers the kingdom in Daniel 7. You know, Son of Man is the one who comes into the Father's presence to receive the kingdom at the end of ages. That's me, Jesus says. To see in Jesus the Son of Man, the one God is using for the new creation, for the new kingdom. In one chapter, this man goes, I don't know who is he. Oh, he must be from God if he can perform miracles. Too. He must be a prophet. And saying, you are the Son of Man, I trust you. And bows down. So what needs to be healed? Eyes? Yes. The problem is this side of eternity? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. This side of eternity never predictable. Let God be God. I praise God for any healing which takes place. But ultimately, God is interested in our spiritual perception. He can repair the limbs, the eyes, on the other side of eternity. But then he can't do anything with the heart that is rebellious. And that's why he deals with that. Healing our spiritual perception is more important than healing our limbs of illnesses. When the disciples look at this guy, they see an object for discussion. Interesting discussion that makes them feel superior. When the neighbors look at him, they see an eyesore. A problem that the society cannot solve. When the parrots look at him, 
they see the power struggle going on in the community, in the society. When the Pharisees look at him, they see a broken rule, Sabbath violated. But when Jesus looks at him, he sees a child of God who has suffered so intensely that needs to be redeemed by the power of God to the level of spiritual insight and courage that will stun the world. See, nobody ever looked at sick people like Jesus did. Be careful, little eye, that you see what Jesus saw. Be careful, little feet, that you go where Jesus went. Be careful, little hands, what you do. You see, God cares about brokenness. About spiritual brokenness, about uh, physical brokenness, about emotional brokenness, about social brokenness. As it was said, he wants to heal more than our cholesterol. He wants to heal all dimensions of our functioning. God cares about all brokenness. And that's why when Jesus came, healing was central to his mission. Healing for Jesus was not just something he did to attract big crowds. That was a sign that in Jesus, God's work of healing human brokenness had begun. And that's why you read in Matthew 8, one day a man with leprosy came to Jesus and I said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, what? Is the problem with me being willing? Of course I am willing. He stretched out his hand and he touched him. Now, do you understand what's going on here? In a society where you have to cry out, unclean, unclean. Leprosy is considered such a disease, such a sickness, it needs not only to be healed, it needs to be cleansed. It makes you not only ill, it makes you unclean. But somehow the suffering people are drawn to Jesus in the New Testament. They see that with Jesus the kingdom is coming. The good news is coming to people who are sick. Now I would expect that Jesus will heal him and then he will touch him. Not with Jesus. Jesus wants this leper to remember this for the rest of his life. There was something about this Jesus that allowed this leper even to think that he could break the conventional rules, to cry out and say, you could do something about this. If you were willing, you said the problem was never on God's side. The problem was never how God sees you. Of course I want. And he first touched him, and then he healed him. He wants him to remember this touch. Because with Jesus, the kingdom comes. There is a study from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, that find out that people who receive 10 meaningful touches in a day actually live longer than people who don't have significant touches. One psychology says, once I heard a husband, when he heard this, he turned to his wife and said, one, two, three, four. See, we g <coughs> men sometimes struggle with significant, meaningful touch. <laughs> but Jesus understands. He wants to, re to heal all brokenness. And you know how he does it? If you follow in Matthew 8 in your Bible, you read that afterwards, he after the leper, he healed the ser centurion's servant. Then he healed a demon-possessed man. Then he healed a blind man. Then he healed a mute man. Then he healed a sick woman. Then he healed a dead girl. And then he healed a paralyzed man. And then, as Jesus went on from there, from healing the paralytic, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth, and he told him, follow me. 
And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, why do you have this story after all these healing miracles that he mentioned, starting with the leper in 8, 1, in chapter 8 and 9? Why do you have this miracle? What's the purpose? Now, let me ask you, who wrote Matthew's gospel? Matthew. You see, in the medical crowd, it's, it's easy to get a good answer. You are a clever guy, <laughs> clever lot. Now, why did Matthew mention this story? Because Matthew wants you to hear, I got healed. Not so much from in my body, but my conscience was weighed down with guilt. My heart was kind of sick. I was isolated from most of my countrymen. My soul was empty, but Jesus changed that. I am also one of those guys that Jesus healed. Never everyone, no one looked at sick people at, and sinners like Jesus did. And they knew Jesus noticed, Jesus cared, Jesus saw, Jesus touched them. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Because sometimes little eyes and little hands and little feet that ought to know better, somehow they forget to see what Jesus saw and to go where Jesus went and to do what Jesus did. Oddly enough, there was a healing community around Jesus. Roman historians tell us that in A.D. 165 and then 251, a major epidemic came to Roman Empire. We don't know exactly whether it was smallpox or black death or what kind of plague, but one-third to one-quarter of population died. Now imagine that. If you are from Czech Republic, 10 million people, four, one-quarter of people died. If you are from Germany, 80 million if you are from America, 300 million. Imagine if one-third of population died in your country. Somebody would notice. But in that pagan world, the thought that predominated in Roman Empire was every man for himself. Now, listen to what Roman historian Dionysus says. At the first onset of the disease, when the plague came, People pushed the sufferers away and they fled from their dearest. That is, spouses from their spouses, parents from their children, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses, unburied corpses as dirt. This is what happened. But you know, the followers of Jesus remembered that Jesus cared for sick, that he touched the lepers that nobody else would touch, that he healed people even when he got into trouble. And now they were his body. Careful little eyes what you see, careful little feet where you go, careful little hands what you do. And so they decided to actually do what Jesus did. And they took the people in, even those who did not believe like them. They cared for the sick and dying at the cost of their own lives. And you know what happened? Everybody said, you are crazy. That's the end of Christianity. You are going to die out. And many of them did. But many of them survived. Without medicine, they survived. You know why? Because isolation, which looked actually as the best strategy for survival, is actually deadlier than plague. And community, care, touch, food, praying, love, are actually healing. There was an Alameda County study. Alameda is a part of uh, San Francisco, Oakland area, that followed 7,000 people in California over a period of nine years. And you know what the researchers found? They found that the most isolated people were three times more likely to die than people with strong relational connections. 
And not only that, they discovered that people who had bad health habits, that means people who were smoking, drinking, e poor eating habits, no exercise, alcohol use, and so on, but had strong social ties, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits, jogging, eating right, but were isolated. Now, let me translate that into vernacular for those of you who are not medical or scientific people. Eating Kit Kat with good friends is better than eating broccoli alone. <laughs> eating chocolate with friends is better than eating broccoli alone. Somebody should say... There was another study published in Journal of American uh, Medical Association. They infected 276 people with the common cold. Isn't that strange what people subject themselves to? But they did. And you know what they found out? That people with strong emotional connections did four times better fighting of illness than those who were isolated. People who were connected with other people were less susceptible to cold, they shed less virus, and they produced significantly less mucus than those who were isolated. I am not making this up. People who were connected with other people produced less mucus. If I were at Newbold, I would say, write this down. Unfriendly people are snottier than friendly people. This is the power of healing and community. So, nobody can alleviate all the trouble, all the sickness and pain in the world. But if we are healed by Jesus, everybody can do something with their ordinary lives. So, here's the question. As you go home tonight and tomorrow from this conference, What's going to change? Are you going to go home with better arguments? Be careful, little stomach, what you eat. Watching the plate of somebody else. Having a better argument why they shouldn't be eating as they are eating. Why should be practicing this or doing that? Be careful, little eyes, what you see, that you see what Jesus sees. Ask Jesus to open your eyes to see what he wants you to see. Be careful, little feet, that you go where Jesus would go. God wants you to get out of your comfort zone and go where he would go. And then, be careful, little hands, what you do. Because he wants you to do something new that you have not tried before. Very few of us will be part of solution to the various pandemics that ravage, are still ravaging our world. <coughs> All of us will have encounter pain, suffering, and sickness. But if we reach out to others in love, Jesus is there. But for that, I need to be healed. I need to ask God for a soft heart so that we together are a healing community around Jesus.